Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul tutorial series on Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1. .1. In this video we're going to talk about space planes, or at least we're going to start talking about space planes. There are a lot of topics to cover in the area of space planes. But first we need to get a couple of mods into our install. We could go over quite a lot of mods, but we need two m sort of minimum as far as I'm concerned. So this is our tutorial install that's, that I've gone over in this playlist, if you will in this tutorial series so far. Uh, there are a couple of additions. Uh, a set uh, props is for the internals, the rest prop monitor that goes with the shuttle. I don't know if the internal of the shuttle is even working, so it may not be necessary, but uh, you might want to toss that in just in case. And uh, somebody asked, uh, I was having trouble with the cockpit of the shuttle appearing. And so make sure you have JSI, that folder with raster prop monitor. Raster prop monitor has the, the cockpit information, if you will, as configured. So that might be helpful. Make sure you have the right version of raster prop monitor, not the 1.7 version. You need the 1.8 version. And so, yeah, um, hopefully you've gotten the same setup I have. I explained about the shuttle, how to install it, and how we have the textures in the space shuttle system. And uh, here I have space launch system. That's actually only for the nose cone on the boosters because I didn't like the look of the nose cone otherwise. So I wanted the one from this. So yeah, uh, that you don't need. All right. So given that, we have B9 procedural wings and I'll link this in the video description. So we are just going to grab this, make sure we grab the right version. So download for KSP 1.8. And we'll take this. It says update for 1.9.1 as well. So this will allow us to make more customized wings, which will be necessary. All you need, so this is what you get when you unzip. And you need to go to game data and get this B9 aerospace procedural wings and dump it into the folder like this. Okay. So next, I would recommend Atmospheric Autopilot, which will help the planes control more naturally. So we see here, update for 1.8, that's good. And Atmospheric Autopilot, it seems to require this KSP upgrade script fix. So we'll grab that, might as well grab the license as well. We've already got Module Manager though, and an updated one, so let's not take that. And there's Atmospheric Autopilot. Okay. So those are the two mods and I'll link uh, the two GitHub pages in the video description. And let's talk about planes. So the thing about planes is you basically have two main requirements. You want the center of mass to not move while it drains fuel. And you want the center of lift to be behind the center of mass. That's planes for you. And uh, the center of lift should be relatively close to the center of mass, but behind. As long as the center of mass doesn't move a whole lot, um, then you can be sure that the center of lift will stay behind the center of mass. Beyond that, like with rockets, planes are designed with a purpose in mind. And they take a whole lot more forms than rockets do because they have a lot more different purposes. And whereas rockets, you know, the main purpose is when, when we were talking about designing a rocket, uh, taking a payload and putting it into a particular kind of orbit, right? Low Earth orbit, uh, geosynchronous orbit, or to the moon or something like that. But planes have a lot of purposes. So they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. So here we have the pregnant guppy. And it's always my favorite example because, you know, it's a purpose-built plane, but it doesn't look like the shape that you normally expect to find planes in. You expect them to be more streamlined, but this has a purpose. Its purpose is to carry a very big physical payload. In in this case, for instance, one of the stages of the Saturn V, well, that one definitely is. Uh, this is the third stage of the Saturn V that it carries. And these have to be payloads that are hollow because if they weren't hollow, if they were really heavy, the plane wouldn't be able to carry them with four propeller engines. So they're generally tanks or large, you know, construction structures that are going to be empty. So that's what it's for. And it does that job so well that it's been in service for a very long time. And NASA still uses it. 
So that's the kind of thing we're talking about. So it's an unconventional shape, but there are a lot of unconventional shapes. Sometimes it's just because the designer is a little bit too creative. A good example is Bert Rutan's boomerang. This is the model 202, I think it is. The Rutan boomerang is an asymmetric plane. Bert Rutan is a very clever person in terms of aerodynamics. This might be a little bit too clever, but uh, you get the point. Uh, there's a lot you can do. With planes, the center of thrust doesn't have to go through the center of mass, unlike with rockets. And that's because the aerodynamic surfaces of the plane can generally keep it steady, even if, for instance, on a normal airliner, you have the engines underslung. The engines also tend to be fairly heavy, so they do pull the center of mass towards them to some extent. But you can have the engines in unconventional places, and... But in this case, of course, if you've got to do something asymmetric like this, it's a good idea to sort of center them up. But Bert Rutan, of course, is responsible for a space plane. That's uh, Spaceship One here. And this was designed to go not to low Earth orbit. This is a space plane that just goes into space and comes back, right? It's a short hop like Alan Shepard's flight suborbital. And it is purpose-built for that. It is carried by another plane and characteristic to Burt Rutan. They look very odd, but uh, it's White Knight and the Spaceship One. So this is the carrier plane way of doing space planes. So this is similar to uh, X-15 and a B-52, right? B-52 carries the X-15 and drops it, and the X-15 goes to space uh, briefly. And there are other planes that, uh, that have this sort of arrangement. For instance, the the max space plane which i thought i had in a tab here actually but let's type that up okay so the max space plane as you can see rides on the top of an an-225 and it is an orbital space plane so it has this big tank with it you can see here it's got a big tank to feed its main engines which are on its tail just like the shuttles are and the an-225 gets it to uh, you know airliner kinds of added uh, altitudes and then it has to do the rest on its own. It's a fairly small space plane. It's a pain in the rear end to try and get it off of the AN-225 safely, let me tell you. I've tried this. I haven't succeeded. So that's rough. But this, so this uh, piggyback idea can work for orbit too. The math works out with the max space plane, even though the simple physics of trying to get off of the AN-225 might be difficult. So yeah, that is one idea. But there are a lot of things that you might want to consider when it comes to utilizing wings on things to do with space. Uh, it doesn't just have to get into space or get into orbit. For instance, you might consider putting wings on your boosters. And NASA has thought about this. And in order to test this sort of idea, it created the AD-1 which has an oblique wing, also sort of supporting my idea that crazy ideas with planes can happen. Now, you can sort of see why this might be useful for a booster, right? So when the booster is going up, it, the wing will be folded in, you know, um, parallel to the body. But then it'll fold out, swing out, when it's time to fly, when it's time to glide back to wherever it needs to go back to. And so this is an obvious idea that NASA would be interested in. So, uh, of course, it swings out fully. It doesn't stay. It doesn't say stay angled like this. But you could try that with the robotic parts in Kerbal Space Program. You could try to put this sort of oblique wing on your booster and see if it works out in Kerbal Space Program. So that is a thought. Um, now let's talk about wing forms, right? So we saw with the max space plane that has a delta wing. We we're sort of used to that with the space shuttle, right? The space shuttle has this um, sort of doubled delta wing, one, uh, one that has the first bit at a really steep angle and then it juts out like that. But space planes don't have to have delta wings. Uh, we have the X-15 with a straight wing. Why, why do some have straight wings? When do you want a delta wing? One reason why a lot of fighter planes have delta wings is the center of mass is really far back because they have really big engines and the engines are really heavy. Uh, compared to the mass of a jet fighter, the jet engine actually takes up a lot of the mass of the overall empty weight of the fighter. 
So the center of mass tends to be pulled back. So a delta wing makes sense. Now there's a sort of downside to having the delta wing. And that's because the pitch authority is very limited. If the center of mass is around here-ish, then the, the sort of pitch authority is dependent on how far away from the center of mass your control surfaces are. So the further away from the center of mass your control surface is, the more effect it has. And if the center of mass is this far back and the control su surfaces are just here, then it has limited pitch authority because, well, it's just not very far from the center of mass. So they tend to make the control surfaces bigger. But if you really want it to be maneuverable, the way to go is to make a canard, right? So the center of mass is in the bat because of the heavy engine and you put a canard up front to increase the pitch authority. Now, with the rocket engines, as opposed to jet engines, rocket engines are really light compared to jet engines. So you don't need the delta wing because if, you're just, if you just have rocket engines in the back that are meant to push this plane, they're not gonna be that heavy. Um, thanks to their greater efficiency, they're just spewing all that stuff out at really high velocity. So you can have the straight wing, and the benefit to a straight wing is you have less stuff to cover with insulation, with uh, tiling, with uh, heat resistant uh, thermal protection. So a lot of the early shuttle ideas had straight wings, but that was before cross range. Cross range is the ability of the shuttle to deviate from its course while in the atmosphere. Another reason why the shuttle needs a large wing compared to the X-15 is its engines are much heavier. The reason why its engines are much heavier is because it's also going to be pushing this large external tank. It's not just pushing its mass. Unlike the X-15, which is just pu pushing the plane's mass, the space shuttle has to push all of this. And so it's got bigger engines. And we've seen another plane like that, the MAX, right? The MAX has bigger engines. So it has to deal with this huge tank, and that means that it's more suited to a delta wing. And so that's something to think about. So that's why it's got this cute little delta wing. But the Max space plane didn't need to worry about cross range because the Soviet Union is very big. So you don't need to deviate 1,000 nautical miles for any reason. You could pretty much find an airfield at some point uh, in order to land the Max space plane because there's a lot of land. So you don't need the really big wings. These wings are relatively small compared to the body. Okay, so with that, we are going to fire up KSP and let's start off with a suborbital space plane. So here we are in the space plane hangar and I have not tested what I'm about to do, so we are going to see together whether it works out or not. So we've got relatively few parts. A normal airplane install for me has like the maximum number of parts. I put everything with airplane parts in, but uh, this is probably for the best if we want to, you know, take a careful look. Why are there two of these? Well, there's a Mark One cockpit here, and there's a 1.25 meter cockpit there. This says one person space plane cockpit ready for suborbital or very gentle Leo reentries X-15 class. This one says two-person space plane cockpit ready for Leo re-entries. Well, we are going suborbital, so let's just go with this. It'll be lighter anyway, and that hopefully will make things simpler. So what I want to do is have a space plane that will just take off from the ground and go up and come back down. That is not as simple as you might think. So here we are. And, well, it's pointy-nosed and everything, but how much do we need? Well, it sort of depends on the engine that we want to use. I mean, we could just go with... There are a lot of engines we could go with, actually. But we're not going to need something too heavy. So to get off the ground with a plane, of course, you don't need a thrust-weight ratio of 1. You probably do need a thrust-weight ratio of 1 to uh, do the rocket part of it. Uh, but for the jet part of it, as far as getting off the ground, I don't think I want to use a rocket to get off the ground. But for the jet part of it, you probably do want a thrust-to-weight ratio of 1, so... But not too much more than that. The jet engines have two jobs. Uh, one to get us off the ground, 
and to uh, reasonable altitude to light the rocket, and uh, two to perhaps close the distance if we come back and we don't really have the right approach. I'll go with the J-57. No, that's pretty heavy. Oh yeah, and mass might be a thing. The mass of the engines... This is nicer. One ton gives us 78 kilonewtons. We want the lightest jet engines that we can get. You can see this is one ton for 78 kilonewtons. A one ton rocket engine. This is a rocket engine LR-105. This is only half a ton and gives us 240. So this is why I say the rocket engines tend to be fairly light. It's jet engines that are really heavy. Maybe we'll have dual rocket engines. Let's see. We'll go with the integral structure tanks. I don't know at the moment how much fuel we're going to need. But we want the center of mass to be consistent, right? We want it to stay centered. So the tank has to be at the center. Now, we've gotten this 0.8 ton cockpit. And we've got this 1 ton engine on the tail. So, if we really wanted to be particular about it, we probably want 0.2 tons up front here. And then our tank will be perfectly centered on the center mass, give or take the wing, right? Our control surfaces. We're probably going to have to use some RCS. So I'm going to have a separate RCS tank. I'm going to just go with the silver atlas texture. And this was too big. So I'm just going to put a uh, thruster quadrant. We want them to be reasonably powerful and we want them to be radial. That's probably too big though. I'm going to go with this 100 Newton class. Check the heat tolerance. That's not very heat tolerant. Might want them on the nose, but we don't have a huge thruster selection here right now. In fact, we don't even have the normal unidirectional ones. I don't know where those have gone. I mean, we've got these, but I don't know what happened to unidirectional ones. That's weird. So, our RCS fuel. Uh, let's go with MH and NTO. Uh, let's say tech level 5. And we'll fill that up. So that's 0.2 tons. And we're not going to necessarily guarantee that we're going to expend all of it. I think I'll have the the jet fuel tank forward rather than behind. Now one good thing about B9 procedural wings is it's got capacity in the wings. I don't really need this kerosene tank here, um, possibly. Right now, well, we'll use MechJeb. Um, that's eight minutes on the jet engine. You can see the jet engine is currently providing us with uh, three, a thrust away ratio of three, but we haven't actually filled up this tank yet with the rocket fuel. What kind of rocket engines do we want? Well, um, let's say we fill this up with MMH and NTO right now. So that's probably among the heaviest things that I could carry as far as fuel is concerned. And we see that we're at about seven tons. So I, I'm going to say that I'd like about 10 tons of thrust. Let's remove these tanks for now. And yeah, given where the center of mass is, I'm going to just keep the kerosene in the wing. So, two rocket engines. About 50 kilonewtons apiece is what I'm looking for. This RD-855 is actually... It doesn't have much... I mean, gimbal-wise, that's not great. But maybe we don't have to rely on the gimbling. That sufficiency is not particularly good either. Now, we, what we could do is, remember, the jet engine doesn't have to be aligned with the center of mass. We could do something like this and have a sort of fairing and put the rocket engine still on the butt end of this. Kerosene is, like, probably the best thing. If we could... This is too big. <laughs> We're making a very small space plane, but a kerosene engine would probably be my favorite to use right now. Now, it doesn't matter a whole lot whether it's a vacuum engine or a sea level engine because we're only going to light it at altitude. Even the lunar module descent engine is really big physically. 
though it is, you know, sort of light. You do have a rapier uh, if you want to go with that. Uh, so if you still want to use that, that's methane burning in this case. So that does have the dual mode and unlimited ignitions too. So that can make things easier if you want the easy way. I sort of, I remember liking these RD 105 slash 109, uh, 0105 and 0109s. Hmm. They're peculiar because of the turbo pump, well, the verniers or whatever you want to call them. We can switch to this RD0109. That's a 323 vacuum ISP. It's got the kerosene oxygen mix that I like. It's got about five tons of thrust. We probably need two of them, though. For, for good power, the RD100 series is... I mean, we could do this. Uh, wrong fuel mixture. Ethanol. It's ethanol oxygen. Um, I'm unsure why it's not showing a delta V here. That's worrisome. We've got a few variants. They all run on ethanol and liquid oxygen. But there's two different variants of ethanol. It says 21.4 seconds and it's not providing any thrust or delta V. So I'm going to say this engine is messed up. <laughs> I'm going to have to come to that conclusion. What about vernier thrusters? That's out of the box thinking. They're compact. They have good vacuum ISP. They're probably too small. I mean, look at them. They're, they've got 35 kilonewtons. They seem rather heavy. I don't know why they're that heavy. I mean, the actual engine they're associated with. You see this a 1.238 tons? That's more than the engine that they're supposed to be around. Either the RD-107 or the RD-108. This is the verniers for them. There's no way the verniers are supposed to be as heavy as the main engine or more. So there's a mistake here. <laughs> you can make some really wicked sort of <laughs> rocket plane designs thanks to just simply how huge the engines are compared to the space plane. I mean... There is, there is an opportunity for style here. Two ignitions, lots of gimbal range, very light, fairly small. Yes, I think we'll go with these. RD-8. And then there's also this RD-805, which is based on the RD-8. I think we'll go with the RD-805, which seems lighter and somewhat more efficient and has more ignitions. Single chamber derivative of the RD-8 engine used on the Zenit second stage as I suppose the control system, the verniers. Verniers are nice if you can get a good vernier. So we're going to go back to with the jet engine on the center and I'm going to put... Um, we could uh, add fuel tanks, fuel fairings if you will. These are the old procedural tanks. I'll stick to the these new integrated structure ones for now. So we're going to put four of these. I'm going to go with a smooth cone. I'm worried about the node on the top. It generally goes away if the top is at zero, I think. Let me check. No, the node is still there. So I'm going to put a little cone on there so that we make sure that that node is covered. That's just... Uh, uh, paranoia my part, but there are these procedural nose cones, so we can just use those. Used to be that exposed nodes were a problem, and I'm not sure if they're a problem now, but... Yeah, that's interesting. Why are they like this? Why are they so far away from the body? That makes me think that the body's collider is not in the right place. Uh, that might be a little bit tight in for the jet engine when it decides to uh, 
open up its nozzle, but it's an interesting start, isn't it? Okay, now we've got delta V and thrust away ratio. So what we're looking for for just getting into space is probably something close to 3,000 meters per second. Actually, uh, thinking about about as much as it takes to get to Kerbal orbit, Kerbin orbit uh, in stock is not a bad idea. But we still have to put the wings and get kerosene and everything. So these are B9 procedural wings. Procedural wing early, space plane, supersonic, all moving early. So there's like those canards, you know, where the whole thing moves to control. Uh, all moving space plane, all moving supersonic, and these are the control surfaces. So we're building a space plane, so we're going to use space plane. That determines the heat tolerance and the mass. Uh, so you see this mass str strength multiplier. If you are trying to get a replica of a particular plane, you may want to change the mass strength multiplier. So obviously with the early wings for less powerful aircraft, you'll see the mass strength multiplier is very low because it needs to be it's just lighter, it doesn't need to be as strong, whereas the space plane is at 1. But you'll have to decide what works best, what works correctly for the plane that you're trying to build. So we use, uh, so to bring up the dialog for the B9 procedural wings, you highlight the part, you don't have to click on it, press J. Well, it looks like our wing is going to be pretty far back. Okay, so we're going to we're going to go with a delta, I suppose. I mean, there's only two rules. Center of lift has to be behind the center of mass, and don't let the center of mass move around too much. So offset is like this, so you can make a forward swept or regularly swept wing. There are wings at the center of the body, and then you'll know if the shuttle is at the bottom for better thermal protection. Mostly, if you're going from orbit on down, you're gonna see bottom slung. And I've got future plans for this idea, so we're gonna put it at the bottom too. That will future-proof it, just in case we want to bring it to orbit. I'm gonna give it a little tilt. Okay, and we can change its shape. Now, in terms of the airfoil, which is the cross-section here, there's not a lot of reconfiguring that you can do, even though the airfoil, the cross-section of the, the wing, is actually very important to what happens with it. So that's one downside. We gotta make the tip thinner than the root. So we gotta put the control surfaces in the back here. Probably the ones directly under the engines um, we are not gonna have move around. We'll just have them hold steady. You can change the leading edge and trailing edge as well. So when we press J on here you can see you can change the leading edge width like so and trailing edge width I'm actually gonna tighten those up a bit okay and then you can change the color so there's uniform standard uniform you'll only see the effect if you turn up the opacity so you can make Increase the opacity, change the hue, saturation, brightness. Let's try and match the blue color of the body, shall we? That's close. And then the bottom side we have here on uh, HRSI, which is the same as the shuttle's heat tiles. LRSI is the same as the top part of the shuttle, the white part. Okay, and we're going to have some angle to it, too. So, I mean, we've already got... Uh, fair abundance of electric charge in terms of getting to suborbital trajectory since that's gonna be a like 20 minute mission we don't need to pack a whole lot in we've already got the food water and oxygen for tech life support stuff now we've got some RCS 
and most importantly we've got fuel we could put more fuel in here so that can happen we're going to end up pulling the center of lift back further because of the control surfaces and the vertical stabilizer which uh, will take a little bit more discussion uh, and we can put the kerosene in the wing so one nice thing about B9 procedure wings is this kerosene op the fuel op fueling options in the wing so we've now got that's not a lot of kerosene well that's because the utilization is at one let's bump up the utilization let's give us we we don't need a whole lot of time with the with the jet engine we can always throttle down we don't need to have it at full thrust so yeah I think um, maybe 40 percent we want to make sure that when we get to the rocket engine it's going to have a thrust weight ratio of one so we don't want to overload it with a whole lot of the jet fuel I think maybe we're overdoing it so I've got underutilized the rocket fuel here to lighten it up The jet itself uh, really should be the first thing, but it's using kerosene and the rocket engines are using kerosene, so it's a little bit hard to see what's really going on if we put the jet engine first, so we'll separate it out like that, then we know what the timing is for both. I don't need more than four minutes worth of rocket power. So we're underutilizing, and later on, in order to do different things, like take this to orbit, we might increase the utilization back. So I'm thinking this is okay, and then we have a thrust weight ratio of one there. And now we can switch back to the jet engine first. Okay, so control surfaces. We want space plane ones for the heat tolerance. I'm going to put a set that aren't going to tilt here so that we can just cover the engines. We need to make sure that the width properly shields them. Though they probably have good heat tolerance too. I want them to be relatively thin. And if they're sort of upside down right now. The, the right side is on the top. We can just change that by coloration. That's not gonna change the handling. So we can put RS, HRSI there and then the standard there. And then that fixes that. And then let's make sure the offset covers that gap down there. Okay. So these I'm going to just lock. So control surfaces, just not have them move at all. Okay, there we go. Zero. All right. We can just grab another set. And this will be for pitch only. If it's upside down, the root and tip might be reversed. Again, I haven't noticed that that makes any difference. So right click, standard controls, this pitch only. And we'll have it deflect a maximum of 25 is fine. Center of uh, center of lift is pretty far back, so maybe I'll uh, reduce the width there, bring it up a little bit, and then we're gonna have the last set. This will control roll as well as pitch. We don't need a whole lot of roll authority. Hopefully, it's gonna get pretty wild though on the suborbital flights. It's actually difficult, in to some extent, to do suborbital right with fair mirror space deceptively because the g-forces are pretty bad on the way down and you don't want your wing pieces to rip off so here actually I would like to change the trailing edge width because it's not aesthetically pleasing in this case okay I'm not gonna paint it any further so these are going to need to be on roll 
and I'll keep pitch as well. Pitch is important. Center of mass, uh, sorry, center of lift is far back enough that I'm contemplating canards. But first, uh, let's have some sort of vertical stabilizer. Now, if you put your vertical stabilizers outboard, you'll see some planes like that. But you're gonna have to realize that to some. Uh, you're going to be coupling the roll and the yaw like that because when the rudder uh, turns it's going to create a little bit of a roll moment too. That's why mostly you see vertical stabilizers very centralized on the body. Oh, did I take an all moving one? Okay, so if you accidentally take an all moving one you'll notice that the control surfaces don't want to attach to it. I haven't even talked about FAR yet. We'll talk about FAR in a sec. That's, a, that's another business. In many ways, making a plane in realism overall is much easier than in Curl Space Program. For one thing, the drag that you encounter when passing the speed of sound is less. And so that, that whole thing goes smoother. And the second important feature is that you have fair mirror space giving you a whole lot of data to work with which you just don't have in Kerbal Space Program by default. And that data is really valuable. Uh, and uh, it's sometimes tough to understand what it's trying to tell you because we aren't all aerospace engineers. But uh, the, this is the kind of information that people pay a good lot of money for to model with software. So... Lots of respect to uh, Fair Mirror Space for that. It's basically your own little wind tunnel with actually more information than a wind tunnel will give you. Now, for a name, I'm just going to call this Blue for now. Keep it simple. Landing gear. Well, we have just the stock landing gear options. Uh, we do have tweak scale, though. We no, we don't. No, we do. We have a scale thing here anyway. Okay. Um, did I put tweak scale in this install? I forget. I didn't. So this scale thing is just uh, something that happens. <laughs> I I don't know where the scale thing comes from, but okay. We have a scale thing, even though we don't have tweak scale. Good to know. We want the landing gear to be flat and sort of perpendicular to the surface so it doesn't skid around a whole lot. The nose wheel gear is not as important as the main gear. The trick with the main gear is, I learned this a long time ago, we want to put it on the body and we want to snap on and we can sort of uh, no. Get straight up and down on the center of the body. Never attach it to the wings. And rescale. And we want it, the main landing gear, to be just behind the center of mass. Like so. Otherwise, the aircraft will not be able to rotate if it's too. Uh, too far back and it's also gonna flop on its tail if it's too far forward so then we just tweak the landing gear out as far as we need it to go heat tolerance in the landing gear is very good in fact better than the body or the wings so uh, that we do not need to worry about they look a little bit long compared to where the nose wheel gear is gonna be so we can reduce the scale of them a little bit but obviously when we rotate we don't want to scrape the tail so we need them big enough to avoid that we might want the nose wheel gear a little bit bigger to make sure the nose is pointing up rather than down when we take off the whole body seems a little bit rotated it's a very squat thing very squat thing that I've made here we haven't put air intakes 
Well, you thought I'd forget, didn't you? I'm just going to use... We, uh, we don't have a very complicated... This isn't something that needs a RAM error intake or anything like that. This isn't a ramjet or even the SR-71's engine. So perhaps these adjustable intakes, wow, they're huge. <laughs> okay, um... These do not have... They don't have tweak scale or anything like that. Okay, we're gonna have to go with the cute ones. These guys. How is this cockpit so small? We could put the RCS thrusters in a better location. We could put a lot of things in a better location, but let's see. Let's save this. Firm airspace. I'm yeah, I I feel like I would be trying to explain all of aerodynamics. I'm sure there are videos on firm airspace, and I'm not set up to give you all the details, but one thing we can see is at a Mach number of 0.35 and an altitude of zero, this is all green. And that makes me happy. Uh, other information that I'm looking at on this data and stability derivative section is the angle of attack that we would need to have uh, necessary lift force, as you can see when you hover over it, is 7 degrees at 117 meters per second. So that means that to get lift, we need to have our nose pointing up 7 degrees, which is a pretty good lift off um, attitude, right? Once we uh, rotate, we can probably get that. This is with flaps up. We aren't. We, have, we don't really have flaps configured anyway. Okay, but what happens when we go to Mach 1? It's all green. At 5 kilometers, all green. Mach 2, all green. Mach 3, all green. Mach 4, ah. Oddly enough, Mach 3, okay, Mach 4, a little bit of a problem. Mach 5, no, not 54, Mach 5. Okay, let me see if the Mach 4 problem clears up at a higher altitude, because we're not going to be going Mach 4 at 5 kilometers. Okay, so I think it's just an altitude. Uh, we don't want to be going that fast at such a low altitude anyway. We're probably going to be 20 kilometers or higher at that point. So Mach 5, Mach 6, Mach 7, Mach 8. And now we have a yaw problem. That's what that's one thing I was sort of expecting. There's always a yaw problem. Um, that's 2,337 meters per second. I don't think we need to be going that fast. So let's get a maximum velocity for this. Mach 7.1 or 2,074 meters per second. It's very X15-ish velocities. So, okay. So that's just to get a sense of things. Nothing will give you a better sense than actually flying it. But you can see the kind of data that FAR gives you. And another little piece of information is transonic drag. This actually has a lot of unnecessary drag because its wing isn't shaped ideally. It's sort of blocky. And so when we see the cross-sectional area, you can see what you want out of this when you click cross-sectional area to minimize transonic drag is to have a very smooth curve overall. You can see that, as expected, we have a sort of dip here. This is a problemish area. This is where you're going to get a lot of drag. And that's because that's where our wing starts. And it, it's sort of precipitous. You can uh, Basically, all this is measuring is the cross-sectional area. It's just the area of each cross-section. And so it's going up smoothly as the body increases in area and then over here it's very flat so what you might want to do in order to solve this cross-sectional area problem is maybe extend the wing root you know and not to such a small extent but maybe have something a little bit beefier in that location I don't know if we could uh, this is the wrong shape for it Uh, that's getting there. So you can see what what you're eventually gonna get is that double double sweep 
that the shuttle has. Right? Something like that. And then that starts to smooth out that curve instead of giving you the unnecessary drag. So that's why you have that sort of thing going. And then uh, the way it sort of peaks out here isn't the greatest. And that's due to the sharpness of the edge here. On the other hand, uh, for a lot of space planes, you actually want drag. You're not, uh, this is a exceptional case where we're actually going to try and take off and break the speed of sound with the plane. But a lot of the time you're launching with a rocket like the shuttle or um, you have some sort of carrier plane. But then even then you're breaking the sound barrier with the plane. So uh, in the case of the space shuttle is the one case where you don't really need to worry about drag uh, because drag is helpful on the way back down. It slows you down and it means that you're not uh, incurring as much heat on the way back down. So curvature, cross-sectional areas, in general all of these you want to see smooth. So this is not good and this is not good but the most uh, so minimal wave drag is achieved by maintaining a smooth minimal cr curvature cross-section curve including the effect of intake or engine ducting the green one is the most important but yeah but this is sort of a drag issue in general this plane but okay we want to turn that off but okay all right let's see if it works at all okay this is probably a bad idea but here we go throttle up uh, now atmospheric autopilot so in order to engage atmospheric autopilot we would press p and that enables atmospheric autopilot which controls differently than sas and we'll start off with atmospheric autopilot it gives a lot of other options like uh like cruise flight controller and all that i just mainly focus on the standard fly-by-wire that's what I've got enabled right now and it sort of moderates things and helps with the turns makes it all smoother and seem more like a plane basically so throttle is up and that's on we don't need SAS if that's on and ignition now realism overhaul jet engines automatically go into afterburner so you don't have to toggle the afterburner manually or anything and I'm beginning to try to rotate very gently. And it's not pulling up. Okay, it definitely should have been able to pull up right now. So we're, we've got a problem. Uh... Oh, don't do that. Okay. And all right. So recover vessel. We weren't rotating properly. So maybe we need to shift the landing gear a little bit closer to the center of mass. Adding tweak scale to make sure that the engine intakes can be reduced in size might be a good idea. So I'm going to put it here. Generally, you want to put it as far forward as you can without it flopping on its tail. Okay, here we go again. Roll up, P, and engage. Oh, 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 that's really fast for it to be taking off, but okay. We might need more wing area. We sort of want that it's full of fuel, so we can forgive it, but we certainly want the takeoff to be less than that Mach 0.35 that FAR started us off at. Now because the jet engine and the rocket engines both use the kerosene, we have to be careful about how much kerosene we're using. Uh, it looks like it's a little bit heavy. It definitely needs more wing area. 
Then again, it'll be fairly light on the way back down once it's dumped all the fuel. So you don't really want to deviate too much from the prograde vector when you want to accelerate. Uh, it won't really accelerate if you're turned away from the prograde vector. I'm just gonna go ahead and light the rocket engines now. And pull up. Again, we should have a thrust weight ratio of 1, so we can go straight up now. But again, make sure we're pointing at the prograde vector, otherwise we still won't accelerate, because the aerodynamic surfaces will cause drag otherwise. And we actually want to go a little bit backwards so that we will tend to work back towards the runway. So we're actually going to lean a little bit further like that. I will want surface info out. Uh, I haven't configured it properly it looks like. I'm going to shut down the jet engine now. It's hardly producing any thrust anymore. I'm just going to keep going back. You can see the surface horizontal speed. I want to have a little bit of horizontal speed back towards the cape there. Okay. Close to running out. Ah, it looks like we have a surplus of oxygen, darn it. We're not going to have the jets. Oh well. Looks like we're going to have to figure out how to glide it in, if that's possible. Oh well, I could get a little bit of kerosene left over. Uh, we've passed the 100 kilometer mark, and that's what I'm going for right now. Technically, space is 140 in, in Realism Overhaul, but I was just trying to do a sort of um, X-15 sort of thing. So obviously we need to flip over, because this is the wrong way around. We're heading this direction, that's good. But we're going to be plunging down at a very prodigious speed. <laughs> and unless you want the uh, control surfaces to rip off, you're going to have to let it do that. I don't want orbital velocity. Make sure it stays on surface. I'm actually going to take it off atmospheric, atmospheric autopilot and go with SAS for now. We're not in, well, we're sort of in the atmosphere, but not enough atmosphere. Okay, we are going down. And I sort of want to be flat to the thing, but when we get to a certain altitude, it's going to force me to prograde vector. But for now, we can sort of be aero braking. Uh, to some extent, um, Spaceship One, Burt Rutan's design, is designed to do this. It uh, sort of feathers the wings entirely in order to present a certain surface to the atmosphere. And because it feathers the wings, it doesn't get forced back to the prograde vector. We're not feathering our wings the way that Spaceship One does or Spaceship Two. And so we're, we are going to be forced back to the prograde vector quite violently once we have a lot of air going across our control surfaces. If you're not forced to the prograde vector at that point, uh, you may have a different problem <laughs> because you won't have enough uh, aerodynamic surfaces or their the center of lift is in the wrong place. So we can see our authorities here and here we go. So two huge considerations at this point. One, we don't want the control surfaces to be bending at all. I'm gonna turn SAS off. We're just gonna let aerodynamics do its thing until we slow down. Two, uh, we really don't want to heat up a whole lot. Uh, air brakes might have been a good idea, and but we don't have them right now, so here we go. Uh, be gentle with it. Oh, let's rock in a bit. Uh, I don't want it to... I've let go of the control stick. I don't want to it to do anything. You can see it'll slow down on its own. The trick at this point is not letting the control surfaces rip off and then but also gaining control in time so you don't hit the ground. So 
So I've got atmospheric autopilot Generally, when you're below Mach 3 would be a good thing. So, yeah. How's that for a thrilling idea? Okay, we do need the jet engines now. I should have action grouped those other engines to shut them down. Okay. We are very light now. So we're not going to need as much speed to maintain lift. I'm going to let the RCS keep puffing just to get rid of the RCS fuel, which we don't need anymore. Uh, it's not pulling up as much as I'd like. It seems a bit nose heavy. We could see in the SPH that the center of mass was fairly far in front of the center of lift. And that might be a problem. We might want those closer together. Wow, it slows down quite a lot very quickly. And, and again, in a way that's good. <laughs> Otherwise, this would have crashed into the ground instead of me being able to pull up. I'll turn off the RCS now. Oh, it doesn't want to pull up. Uh, oh no. Ow. Ah, I was so close to being good. <sighs> but too nose heavy. Yep, too nose heavy. I don't suppose any part with Jeb happened to survive this. No, Jeb the way, went the way Jeb always does. Okay, well, with this forlorn landing gear, I'll call this a tutorial. Uh, maybe I should have ended on a positive note and success to indicate the fact that I know what I'm doing, but hopefully you got something out of it. And uh, we'll continue from here. There's a lot of stuff to cover still. And we'll talk about making a space shuttle as well. So uh, the particular things that I want to do is obviously we need to talk about getting to orbit with a space plane and then the space shuttle. So with that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.